right. Well, thank you, Dr. Aiken, and, and uh, thank you again uh, to Dr. Aiken and Dr. Moeller for setting us up. It's been great to be back at, at, at Southern. I'm, I'm so thankful for what's going on here uh, and, and feel a very close bond to my brothers and sisters who are here. Uh, this lecture, as Dr. Aiken said, emerges from my current book project on the Second Great Awakening, uh, which hopefully, Lord willing, will be out with Yale University Press in 2025. Uh, the Second Great Awakening, uh, as, as you may know, is a standard topic in American religious history, but the term the Second Great Awakening didn't become common until about seven or eight decades after the, uh, the Second Great Awakening. And even today, historians are unclear as to what the Second Great Awakening entailed or how long it lasted. So I want to give you the sort of 30,000-foot look here just for a second about what, what the Second Great Awakening actually was, and then I want to focus mostly on Charles Finney for the balance of this, uh, this lecture. Um, in my book, I'm going to argue that, that the Second Great Awakening, Awakening lasted roughly from 1801 to 1831, and that it was bookended by the Cane Ridge Revival in Kentucky in 1801 and Charles Finney's uh, massive awakening at Rochester, New York in 1830 and 31. And following the great historian Donald Matthews, I tend to see the Second Awakening as, as more of a process than an event or a series of events. Uh, and, and my definition and time frame for it is intentionally broad. The Second Awakening was certainly a series of revivals, uh, but it also included church planting. I, th I think in a, in a lot of ways more foundationally, and it included a massive program of church planting, um, the formation of countless benevolent and missionary organizations, in, including the Baptist Triennial Convention, um, profound theological changes, and much, much more. By 1831, to sort of point to the, to the overall theme of this lecture series, America was far more churched and Christian than it had been in 1776. But the changes sometimes came at a price. And in this lecture, I, I want to focus, as I said, closely on the changes wrought by Charles Finney, who was perhaps the most controversial figure in American evangelical history. The year 1831 saw Finney's triumphs in Rochester, New York, before his move to a New York City church uh, the following year. And after Finney, revivalists became much more inclined to attribute revivals to the obedience of preachers and churches to pray for and pursue revivals. And as a practical matter, conversion under Finney became contingent upon a person's choice to convert. Finney and his followers still, of course, warned of hell, and they spoke of depravity. But depravity now was no longer the inborn debility of original sin. It was the sinner's stark and abhorrent decision, decision not to repent and receive Christ's forgiveness. Sinners now seemingly had the ability to change their own minds and hearts, and Finney forged an enduring program for revival that appeared virtually guaranteed to produce results if the pastor chose to preach revival and if a sinner chose to receive Christ's forgiveness. Finney and his disciples turn away from the Calvinist tradition of Jonathan Edwards, I think was the most dramatic doctrinal transformation in the Second Great Awakening. We don't have time to consider Finney's whole career, of course, uh, but the controversy over Finney's theology and techniques was amply illustrated by the rupture between Finney and the prominent Congregationalist preacher Asahel Nettleton in the late 1820s. Nettleton had experienced conversion in a Connecticut revival in 1801 and 02. He graduated from Yale College in 1809, and he was the key revivalist in New England and parts of New York during the 18-teens, the decade before Finney came to prominence. Lyman Beecher, uh, his one-time mentor and ally, wrote that Nettleton was, quote, the greatest benefactor which God has given this nation, and, quote, among the most efficient instruments of introducing the glory of the latter day, 
Nettleton was a devotee of Jonathan Edwards uh, and a protege of President Timothy Dwight, the evangelical president of Yale College. When he began preaching in Connecticut, Nettleton became familiar with the radical revival tradition there, including James Davenport, the arch radical of the First Great Awakening, a topic that I, I've also written about. Davenport, if you don't know his work, his, his sensational ministry crashed in 1743 when he held a book and clothes burning in New London, Connecticut. Even Davenport's most loyal followers thought that he went too far at this bonfire when he declared that the people's fancy clothes had become idols to them and he took off his own pants and consigned them to the flames. Bet you've never seen that at a revival meeting. And uh, Nettleton believed that th this type of radicalism of the First and Second Great Awakening sprang from the same root. By the 1820s, he believed that the uh, radicalism had manifested itself anew in Methodist and Finneite tactics. These techniques included brashly praying for sinners by name. In other words, you're having a revival meeting and you name Bob and pray for him in the middle of the meeting uh, as an unregenerate sinner. Uh, and I think more interestingly, quote, encouraging females to exhort and pray in promiscuous assemblies. And, uh, and we, promiscuous doesn't have the same connotation, but it means mixed assemblies of men and women. Separated by almost a century, the ministries of Davenport and Finney were high, hardly identical. Uh, Davenport was a Calvinist, unlike Finney. Uh, Davenport was effectively antinomian in his erratic behavior, as seen in him pitching his pants into the fire, uh, while Finney was passionate but controlled. Nevertheless, uh, many observers suggested, especially early on, that Davenport was redivivus in Mr. Finney. In other words, he was reincarnated or, or resurrected in Mr. Finney. Uh, revivalists in the tradition of Jonathan Edwards saw dangers in Davenport's and Finney's ministries that they heartily wished to avoid. Still, Nettleton and other uh, formalist revivalists, moderate revivalists, were ambivalent about revival fervor. They knew that God stirred people's affections, quote unquote, in revival, as Jonathan Edwards had taught. Sometimes converts express themselves in unrestrained ways as they realized the gravity of their sin and the glories of God's grace. So they knew there was a fine line between encouraging decorum and squelching the work of the Holy Spirit. Finney, a lawyer with no formal theological training, experienced conversion in 1821. In sermons of unparalleled intensity, he thundered against sin and warned of God's wrath. But Finney dispensed with the inherent spiritual debility that Calvinists associated with depravity. To Finney, each person was depraved simply because they chose to sin. Thus, they could choose not to sin. No special infusion of God's grace was required to enable a sinner to repent and follow God. Finney's evangelism all came down to the choice principle. God has provided a way for you to be saved. Will you choose to accept it? Finney was raised in the Edwardsian milieu of Connecticut and upstate New York, in other words, the legacy of Jonathan Edwards. Indeed, his family actually attended a uh, Baptist church during his teens. Many people don't know that. But like m many New England families, the Finneys had moved to New York in the 1790s, seeking better farmland. Finney's revivals would convulse the new towns of the Erie Canal route. This canal, connecting the Great Lakes to the Hudson River, opened in 1825. And the population growth and bustling commercial milieu along the canal proved uniquely conducive to Finney's revival ministry. At first glance, Finney's preaching did not seem that different from other Northern Presbyterians and Congregationalists, including Asahel Nettleton's. It certainly was not as unhinged as James Davenport's was, despite the accusation that that's what he was doing. 
Fenny depended on inquiry or anxious meetings, as he called them, to converse with those who were uncertain about salvation. And pretty early on, he also squelched extravagant outbursts of emotion, at least in his own meetings. Some of his disciples do seem to have relished uh, wilder scenes at their assemblies. During a revival in Rome, New York, Finney wrote that he ended a meeting for fear that it would become too chaotic. He told inquirers to suppress their emotions so as to uh, uh, not, quote, make any outcries in the streets. And when some penitents began, quote, loud shrieking, he said he, quote, hushed them down. He insisted that he did nothing quote, to create any excitement in the meeting. The feeling was all spontaneous. One obligation that Finney heavily emphasized was the, quote, duty of immediate repentance for sinners. Yet even this priority drew on a longstanding emphasis of Edwardsian and new divinity revivalism. Uh, New divinity here means the theologians who succeeded and, and debated about Jonathan Edwards' legacy. God demanded immediate repentance by sinners in scripture. You know, now is the day of salvation, the word says. Why shouldn't pastors issue the same call? But there was no question in Finney's revivals about whether sinners could repent. He just demanded that they should repent, and they should repent now. Revivalists such as Nettleton maintained Edwards' classic balance concerning natural and moral inability. Everyone could repent if they willed to do so, people like Nettleton said, but God must change a sinner's will for them to want to repent. By the 18 teens, progressive new divinity thinkers, such as Nathaniel Emmons, pastor of Franklin, Massachusetts, began teaching that sinners could change their own hearts. A person had the choice to respond to God's grace. Any talk about moral inability to Emmons and people like him was endorsing effectively a sinner's continued rebellion. Drawing on Emmons's progressive trend, Finney trumpeted the sinner's choice to repent and believe in every single evangelistic sermon. The focus now was on the sinner's will and what he or she would decide. Now, Finney's theology has generated endless debate, and and maybe some of you know about those debates. And it's also true that Finney was not a careful thinker or writer. Uh, He he was very much a preacher, not not any kind of systematic theologian, which hampers attempts to dissect his beliefs, especially on free will and divine agency. But despite his inconsistencies, uh, Finney clearly rejected sin's debilitating effects on the will. In this, he followed the trajectory of Nathaniel Emmons and the, quote, New Haven theology of Yale professor Nathaniel William Taylor. Taylor argued at Yale that it was irrational to think that God would blame people for sinning if they had no choice but to sin. It was ludicrous, Taylor taught, for preachers to tell people to repent if they were unable to do so. Taylor believed that he had resolved one of the basic tensions in Calvinist theology, uh, the, the, the question of moral responsibility and moral inability. But Taylor's resolution of the problem came at a heavy price. His renewal of human ability and free will jeopardized traditional beliefs about the, quote, sovereignty of God, the dependence of man on God, and the doctrines of election, total depravity, and regeneration, as theologian Joseph Heratunian once put it a long, long time ago. Uh, Taylor's new teaching on natural ability exploded in Congregationalist circles just as Finney rose to prominence. Finney did not engage in as much theological explanation as Taylor did. Finney simply called on his audiences to repent and assumed that they could do so. Now, to be sure, there wasn't much difference between calling for immediate repentance and believing that all who heard, every single person who heard, could respond. 
And Finney and his supporters were not seeking, I think, I don't think they were seeking theological innovation just for innovation's sake. Finney in particular was crafting a pragmatic theology of revival, a doctrine that, quote, worked to produce conversions, one that very much matched the voluntarist mood of Jacksonian America. The problem is that Finney, Taylor, and Emmons, wittingly or unwittingly, had crossed a vast theological gulf in Protestant history. Everyone who heard the gospel now was capable of responding, they insisted. The mysterious workings of God's grace, predestination, original sin, and moral inability, arguably the defining features of the Edwardsian tradition, were rendered virtually irrelevant. Human choice became the hinge of salvation. Now, as part of the arguments about Finney's theology, some have contended that Finney adapted his preaching to the ascendant ascendant Arminian mindset of frontier Methodism, the fastest growing and soon to be the biggest denomination in America in the 19th century. Uh, The Methodists profoundly shaped America's Protestant culture, of course, but as a technical matter, there wasn't an obvious connection point between Finney's thought and the Methodists. Uh, Moreover, Finney implied that no infusion of divine grace and power at all preceded conversion. No infusion of divine grace. And that assertion went well beyond what classic, careful Arminians taught. Arminians argued that God's prevenient grace preceded repentance. But unlike Calvinists, Arminians taught that God made this grace available to all, not just to the elect. Given the theology of radical new divinity theologians, and given Finney's personal background, family and otherwise, in the new divinity movement, it is better, I think, to place him in the new divinity context than in Methodist-style Arminianism. The theological chasm separating Finney and traditional Edwardsians came into full view later in 1831, especially with his controversial sermon, Sinners Bound to Change Their Own Hearts. Finney proclaimed that God, quote, required men to make themselves a new heart on pain of eternal death. This requirement showed that they were able to change their spiritual allegiance without God's intervention. So Finney's surging popularity and the allegations of enthusiastic chaos at his meetings had already put him in Asahel Nettleton's crosshairs by 1827, even before his exotic theology had come fully to light. There was growing popular controversy about Finney, too. Some antagonists threw rocks at the meeting house or discharged guns outside when Finney was preaching. Others burned him in effigy. Uh, The early hostility toward Finney was due more to accusations that he was a Davenportian enthusiast than a theological innovator. Finney, as I've said, was never as radical as Davenport, and his ministry never generated the kind of organic exuberance that revivalists saw in the heyday of the Upper South revivals at the beginning of the 1800s, most notably the Cane Ridge Revival in Kentucky. It turned out that Finney's theology of moral ability was a more enduring feature of his ministry than the alleged Davenport-style enthusiasm. Still, there was enough enthusiasm, and enthusiasm in this time is a very bad word, uh, there was enough enthusiasm at the outset of Finney's work to give formalist evangelicals uh, heartburn. One of the first rumblings against Finney came from several Congregationalist ministers in the Oneida New York Association in 1827, including William Weeks of Paris Hill, New York. They pointed to the presumptuousness and disorder of the Finneyite revivals. In particular, they cited Finney's cohort for, quote, praying for persons by name in an abusive manner. Uh, They alleged that ministers were calling out individuals' names in prayer in you know, public meetings, speaking of them with labels like, quote, an abandoned wretch who was full of hell, 
they also cited the Phineites for encouraging, quote, female prayer and exhortation. And Nettleton even spoke of him allowing, quote, female preaching. In meetings with adult males, critics said women had, quote, no duty to lead but to be in silence, echoing verses, you know, uh, such as 1 Corinthians 14, 34. The controversy over women's roles and disruptive enthusiasm in Finney's meetings long preceded the controversy over the anxious bench, which was his most controversial tactic in his meetings, uh, by years. The anxious bench, if you don't know, was a pew that Finney placed at the front of the meeting house where people in the throes of conversion could come up and receive prayer and counsel. Uh, it's, a, it's kind of a version of the altar call. Um, despite uh, Finney's insistence that he tamp down outbursts when they happened, the congregational ministers criticized the Finneyites for permitting, quote, loud groaning speaking out or falling down in time of public or social worship. And they were worried about him letting women speak in mixed assemblies. Uh, Nettleton visited Albany, New York in 1826, and he and Finney made halting attempts toward reconciliation on revival practices and doctrine. But in early 1827, Nettleton began circulating letters among Congregationalists and Presbyterians summoning a united front against Finney's errors and, quote, new measures. Those letters began to be published in fall of 1827. Nettleton explained that Finney and his abettors, including the Presbyterian pastor Nathan Beeman of Troy, New York, were denouncing seasoned ministers as unconverted if they showed the slightest hesitation about the awakenings. And that had been a standard grievance against James Davenport, too. Beeman's church had already split over the Finneyite uproar and those kinds of tactics. Again, for Nettleton, the Finneyite cohort and their tactics hark back to the controversies of the First Great Awakening, 80, 90 years before, when zealous preachers spoke regularly about the, quote, danger of an unconverted ministry, as New Jersey's revivalist Gilbert Tennant had put it. Then there was Finney's, quote, desperate attempt to introduce the practice of females praying with males, which, quote, raised an angry dispute in the New York churches. To Nettleton, Finney, to Nettleton, Finney and his disciples had caused a civil war in Zion. Finney responded to Nettleton's accusations with the blistering sermon, quote, can two walk together except they be agreed, preached and published at Troy, New York. Finney argued that he and his critics believed in similar doctrines, but those truths affected them in wholly different ways. Quote, lukewarm professors and impenitent sinners might not object to gospel principles, but they object to their vigorous and effective proclamation. Finney presented himself as faithfully applying the teachings of Jonathan Edwards. Holy affections were essential to authentic revival, but they also offended those who were cold and lifeless. Quote, it is the fire and the spirit that disturbs their frosty hearts, Finney contended. Churchly divisions over revival merely reflected the sorting of, quote, real Christians from hypocrites. Genuine revival necessarily produced divisions because there were always people in a church who reject the true work of God. Sometimes a church awakens while their pastor, quote, sleeps and will not awake. In such instances, Fenny suggested, quote, let the church shake off their sleepy minister. They are better without him than with him. Nettleton, of course, could cite Edwards as well as Fenny could. He asserted that Finney's principles were the same ones that broke up the First Great Awakening and that had wrecked the revivals, quote, in Kentucky and Tennessee rising of 20 years since. Pastors who did not distinguish between true and false zeal would become, quote, the greatest traitors to the cause of revivals, Nettleton wrote. Nettleton also faith faithfully sought to enlist Lyman Beecher against Charles Finney. Beecher was arguably the most influential pastor in New England in the 1820s, having recently moved from Litchfield, Connecticut, to the Hanover Church in Boston. And Hanover was one of the few remaining Congregationalists 
churches in Boston that had not been captured by liberal Unitarianism. Beecher thought Finney likely just needed to moderate his extreme tactics to be redeemed for true revival. Still, in a cautionary 1827 letter, Beecher warned Beeman and Finney of a, quote, spirit of fanaticism and spiritual pride that could damage Christ's cause. Like Nettleton, Beecher recalled James Davenport's radicalism and denunciations of fellow ministers that harmed revival in the 1740s. Davenport's follies, as we can see, had lodged deep, lasting prejudices against revival in New England. Beecher urged Finneyites to abandon measures that transgress the bounds, quote, of civilized decorum and of Christian courtesy. He chastised Finneyites for their rash judgments and incendiary language. Beecher also cited, quote, female prayer in promiscuous assemblies as a major provocation, again referencing passages which enjoin women to be silent in church. Quote, I know that these texts have been explained away, Beecher noted, but so have the proof texts which teach the divinity of Christ, the depravity of man, and other essential doctrines. Beecher warned that if revivalism swerved into radical enthusiasm, places such as upstate New York, quote, shall be burnt over and religion disgraced and trodden down and as in some parts of New England as it was done 80 years ago by James Davenport. During that earlier chaos, quote, laymen and women, Indians and Negroes, male and female, preached and prayed and exhorted until confusion itself became confounded. Fenny would later speak of New York as a burnt district too, but Beecher seems to have first popularized the concept of a burned over district. Uh, Whitney Cross, a historian's uh, in influential 1950 book, the, the Burned Over District, made it common for historians to use that term to describe upstate New York in the Second Awakening, which was certainly the epicenter of the late stages of the Second Awakening. A number of scholars have mistakenly presented the Burned Over District as a, quote, wild western frontier, as one recent scholar called it. But most of the revival centers in upstate New York already had significant economic and social development, and they possessed churches ready to promote revival. Maybe if, it's a kind of a common sense thing, but usually there were churches planted before you had revivals. They didn't just happen out in the woods somewhere, unless it was a, a camp meeting. But, but uh, even there, there, there are pe groups of people coming from churches. So church planting normally uh, preceded revival, uh, not, not vice versa. But what kinds of awakenings would these be? To Beecher, a burnt over region resulted when radical enthusiasm became the norm. In conclusion to this discussion, uh, Beecher articulated what I think is the central tension of evangelical revivals, the central, central t tension of revivals. How could evangelical leaders avoid enthusiastic recklessness quote, without diminishing the true spirit and power of a revival. The answer for Beecher was an earnest, traditional, and moderate approach to revival. Uh, Beecher accordingly advised that, quote, there is no need of praying as if God and man were deaf or of wallowing on the floor or, or frothing at the mouth as if filled with hydrophobia which means rabies, uh, instead of the spirit of God, the gospel may be preached faithfully and attended with the power of God without groaning in prayer and crying amen and without female prayers and exhortations. If Brother F, he called him, would simply exercise caution, Beecher believed he would become an invaluable blessing. But Beecher expressed darker reservations to Nettleton in a letter published without Beecher's permission in 1827. Although the Oneida County work had started as a true revival, Beecher warned it would soon become, he said, one of the, quote, most powerful and successful assaults which Satan ever made on the church. Formalist ministers had to reclaim Finney, if possible. In, re in retrospect, of course, Beecher regretted that Nettleton allowed this grim letter to get into print. It was like throwing, quote, a firebrand 
on a train of powder, Beecher said. In July 1827, Finney, Nettleton, and Beecher and about a dozen other ministers met in New Lebanon, New York, hoping to hash out their differences. And, and historians of the Second Great Awakening always point to this meeting as a really critical moment. Uh, some of those at New Lebanon genuinely wanted to reconcile. Beecher and others wished to unite evangelicals in the face of the Unitarian menace. Uh, increasingly, Beecher thought, Finney's not our problem. The Unitarians are our real problem. Uh, and, and of course, as I've said, Unitarians controlled most of the old churches in Boston by this point. The ailing Nettleton was a most reluctant participant at New Lebanon, however. He left the convention after just a couple days. Beecher was only able to convince Nettleton to return on the assembly's last day after the recorded votes had been taken. Nettleton perceived that the convention was unlikely to condemn Charles Finney, the only result he would have found palatable. Nettleton may have also intuited that Beecher's resolve against Finney was weakening. Beecher had recalled that at, at New Lebanon, he warned Finney against preaching in New England, which Beecher saw as his domain. But if Beecher did issue this stern warning to Finney, it was probably the last stand he took against the revivalist. Soon, Beecher and Nettleton's relationship became strained, while Beecher and Finney tentatively reconciled. Beecher went, welcomed Finney when he preached in Boston in 1831. Nettleton's hope for an, an enduring anti-Finney evangelical alliance with Beecher was doomed. In the meantime, resolutions proposed at New Lebanon produced divided votes. Tellingly, the first issue decided was about women pr praying in mixed assemblies. On this matter, delegates split evenly, with the Finneyites supporting women pr praying in informal, quote, social meetings. They did, however, affirm a resolution restricting women's prayers in formal church meetings. A slight majority affirmed that pastors should avoid calling out individuals by name in public prayer. It's fascinating to me to see, you know, them figuring out what's in bounds and what's out of bounds, right, and, and, and what settings. Uh, they, they voted 14 to 3 to support a statement that, quote, Audible groaning in prayer is in all ordinary cases to be discouraged. And violent gestures and boisterous tones in the same exercise are improper. Be Beecher tried but failed to add the phrase unusual postures to this list. Uh, it's just hilarious. So, you know, how, what are they thinking about unusual postures? You know, who knows? But anyway, uh, almost all dele delegates supported, supported a resolution instructing all parties to stop speaking of settled ministers as, quote, cold, stupid, or dead, as unconverted or enemies to revivals, as heretics or enthusiasts, or disorganizers, or deranged, or mad. <laughs> so stop saying those things. We're all going to be nice. So uh, Finney, of course, was, was stung by the criticism from Nettleton and Beecher, but he realized that Beecher was, was indeed becoming more amenable to him. In the coming years, Finney carefully tamped down behavior in his meeting, smacking of enthusiasm. But overall, New Lebanon was a victory for Finney. If he was not entirely vindicated, Finney still came out ahead of Nettleton and other intransigent critics. New Lebanon placed Finney in the national limelight, too. The convention received coverage in a wide range of periodicals. For example, the Western Intelligencer in Cleveland, Ohio, re reprinted the minutes of the convention, and the assembly also inspired an editorial in Kentucky's Western Luminary, uh, which I believe is in Lexington, about women praying in the presence of a man. The editorialist said that he thought a blanket prohibition on women praying in public was impractical. News coverage of Beecher and Nettleton's feud with Finney continued in 1828, but the momentum for fighting began to wane. Beecher and uh, brokered a truce at the Presbyterian General Assembly in Philadelphia in 1828 issuing a statement discouraging any more publications on the controversy. 
Meanwhile, Nettleton had gone to Virginia, where he recuperated from one of his frequent illnesses, and he visited friendly Presbyterians, including John Holt Rice of Union Seminary at Hampton Sydney. Hampton Sydney College was a longtime center of Southern Presbyterian revivalism. Nettleton helped Rice to stoke interest in and around the college, but he also brought warnings about Finney to Southern Presbyterians and enlisted Rice against the Finneyites. Rice, you can see now the debate is going national, Rice wrote to Northern theological leaders, including people like Leonard Woods of Andover Seminary and Archibald Alexander of Princeton Seminary. And the Virginia-born Alexander was a former president of Hampton Sydney, and in 1812, he became the first professor at Princeton Seminary, which had just become an independent institution. Rice told Alexander that the Finneyites meant to, quote, revolutionize the churches with tactics, include, including, guess what, employing females and conducting worship and mentioning names in prayers. Rice urged Alexander to stand against Finney's influence at Princeton. Beecher remained in a more conciliatory mood than Nettleton was. Beecher wrote to Nettleton in mid-1828, explaining that it was, it was just time to stop fighting Finney. Quote, there is such an amount of truth and power in the preaching of Mr. Finney, and so great an amount of good hopefully done, that if he can be so far restrained that he shall do, no, do more good than evil, then it would be dangerous to oppose him. Beecher noted that this letter did not satisfy Nettleton, who continued to see Finney as a grave threat. Related controversy over Nathaniel Taylor's New Haven theology opened with the 1828 publication of Taylor's Concio Ad Clarum sermon, in which Taylor denied that God imputed Adam's sin to hum humanity. He argued that though everyone will inevitably sin, sin is always a free choice. Depending heavily on common sense philosophy, Taylor insisted that it was unreasonable, again, it was unreasonable for God to condemn people for a sinful nature that they had inherited from Adam. Nettleton and his remaining allies arrayed for battle against Taylor and what they called this rankest Pelagianism. Beecher, a close ally of Taylor's, tried again to silence Nettleton. The emerging tension between Beecher and Nettleton culminated in a fraught personal conversation between the two. And it happened improbably in Lyman Beecher's woodshed. Uh, Beecher happened to be chopping wood, and he warned Nettleton to be careful about how he criticized Taylor. Quote, Taylor and I have made you what you are, and if you do not behave yourself, we will hew you down. Now, Beecher said that he made that statement in jest because he happened to be chopping wood at the moment, but Nettleton's side did not take it that way. Beecher left Boston for the new Lane Seminary in Cincinnati in 1832, which distanced him from the controversies over Taylor's doctrines. But the tension in New England became institutionalized when Nettleton and his allies in 1833 founded the Theological Institute of Connecticut, a traditionalist alternative at that time to Taylor's Yale. Presbyterianism would likewise suffer national schism in 1837 and 38, with issues including Finneyite revivalism and free will theology precipitating what's called the old school, new school split. That fracture was preceded by trials of Presbyterian and Congregationalist ministers, including one of Beecher in Cincinnati for holding Taylorite views. By the time of the schism, Finney had left the Presbyterian Church. Like Beecher, he decamped for Ohio, joining the faculty of the fledgling Oberlin College. So revivalism was alive and well in New England and, and New York in the early 1830s. But the Edwardsian tradition was in shambles. Nettleton and Beecher had initially interpreted the Finneyites as a renewal of James Davenport's enthusiastic chaos in the 1740s. But Finney managed to mute the most extreme aspects of his assemblies after the New Lebanon Conference. Beecher and Nettleton could not ultimately agree whether the fight against Finney was worth sustaining or whether Taylor's theology represented a dire threat. 
The most foundational change that Finney introduced, along with Emmons and Taylor, was the muting of divine contingency and the elevation of human decision in repentance and revival. As Finney would explain in his uh, Lectures on Revivals of Re Religion, 1835, God had already given preachers everything they needed to effect revival, and sinners already had everything they needed to choose Christ. The only remaining questions were whether preachers would obey God and preach revival, and whether sinners would repent and believe in Christ for salvation. It was up to them. Finney's other primary legacy was the technique of revival. Some of his methods, such as insisting on immediate repentance and the use of inquirers' meetings, were not new, even in the Edwardsian tradition. Other measures, such as the anxious bench, adapted for Methodists and Baptists, were yet to come as of 1827. As we can see from the debates over his techniques, issues such as praying for sinners by name in public meetings and having women speak and pray in mixed assemblies were controversial well before the anxious bench was. But Finney, having emerged fairly unscathed from the new Lebanon Convention, was ideally positioned to develop his signature revival measures, now including the anxious bench, at Rochester in 1830 and 31. The Finney fever spawned the most consequential American revival since the one at Cane Ridge, Kentucky in 1801. Finney's Rochester work largely resolved besetting evangelical tensions between cautious formalism and unfettered enthusiasm and between fatalism and free will. Finney ruthlessly preached hellfire, but he offered a ready solution to it. He assured every person that they could choose at that moment to be delivered from God's wrath. Salvation was still by God's grace, but as a practical matter, the only contingency left in conversion was human choice. Finney's revivals were likewise full of passion and tears, but Finney no longer countenanced uncontrolled enthusiasm. Pathos was in, spirit-filled chaos was out. In resolving these tensions, Finney set a dominant pattern for American revivalism for at least the next century and a half. He crafted a model for many American successors, including Dwight Moody, Billy Sunday, Billy Graham, as well as legions of evangelists around the world in Baptist, holiness, and Pentecostal traditions. Many of those preachers, of course, were more theologically precise than Finney was, but it would be hard to think of a more pervasively influential text on revival of the past two centuries than Finney's lectures on revivals. Although the Edwardsian revival tradition lingered in figures such as Asahel Nettleton, the dominant revival culture of America had left it behind. Thank you very much. <laughs>